and um, uh, and I, I really want to uh, I really want to encourage you through the month of July. We're we've got several of our uh, young uh, and up and coming uh, leaders, men and women, uh, here at uh, Gulf Coast City Church in the month of July that will be taking the the pulpit, and uh, I'll be given an opportunity for them to share the word of the Lord and and what God's put on their heart for the family here and to minister to you as God has uh, equipped them and has anointed them and has empowered them by his spirit to do so. And I, I would just, I would say that you do not, do not want to miss uh, this, uh, this opportunity as these, uh, these men and women uh, of the faith here at uh, Gulf Coast City Church begin to uh, grow even more uh, in their ministries and what God has uh, anointed and called them to do. So, but this morning, I want to uh, finish this uh, series with a message uh, entitled for us, The Son of Sacrifice. Uh, in John fourteen six, Jesus said, and this is the scripture we've been building on, it's been the foundation that we have been building on the past several weeks in this series, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus, speaking in absolutes here, declares emphatically, without any question, that there is no other way. There's no other way to God. But now, I I, I want to bring some attention this morning to uh, an interesting fact. Rarely does Jesus ever refer to God as God in the Gospels. Jesus' reference to God is always Father. Almost always Father. Whenever he is speaking to us and, and, and our connection and relationship and his relationship to God, he's always referencing and identifying God as Father. Jesus, in fact, here says that uh, He is the only way to the Father. And This morning, I, I want to kind of, I hope, enlighten you and bring some clarity to, again, some things that have either not been shared or taught as they should, or have been mistaught, and has created some confusion in our identification with the Father, understanding Him, our relationship with Him. If you look with me at the statement I have below in your notes, it says, the ministry, mission, and message of Jesus focused on the Father. I want to stop before I read any further this statement that I'm sharing with you and say that, look, the, 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 the mission, the ministry, and the message that Jesus carried was not that of hell, it was that of the Father. I, I want to get something across, and, and I, I really want you to understand where I'm coming from this morning. It's not that Jesus never spoke of those things because he did. It's not that those things in those places don't exist. They do. But the focus that God placed or that Jesus placed was never on the punishment and the judgment, but rather the relationship that would be carried through him with the Father. The focus that Jesus had was always restoring a people without a father or their true father back to the father, and that would only happen by way of him. And again, it's a a message, a ministry, and a mission that somehow has been removed from the church or the church has lost it or has gotten this focus off of that. And, and we've, we've attempted in an effort to try to get people saved. We've tried to scare them 
into the kingdom by focusing our message and making our ministry and our mission all the wrong thing. And even those that do come into the kingdom and do embrace the truth do so with this burden and, and condemnation. So really what's happened is they've just exchanged one form of bondage for another form of bondage. But how many of you know that God doesn't come to bring a burden or a bondage to us? He's come to bring liberty to us. I go on to share in this statement with you that he revealed him, speaking of the Father, represented him, and restored us to him. And it was through Christ, the love of the Father was revealed, was represented, and restored to us. This is so key to our understanding just in the fundamental truths of what is the, the true doctrine, pure doctrine of the Scripture and the Gospel. So let me see if I can break it down a little bit further for you so that you can digest this truth in a revelatory way. John 17, uh, the, the, the very first point I want to bring out is this, uh, and, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but you, you've got to understand that from the beginning, okay, let's just go back to Genesis for a moment. In Genesis, at the fall of man, right there when God begins to address the issue of the fall of man, God lost his position with humanity in the Garden of Eden from that of a father to that of just being God. You, you, you've got to understand the, what happened here. In the Garden of Eden, at the fall of man, God, who was father of humanity, lost his position and his status as father and became just God. So no longer could he relate with man. No longer could he engage with mankind as a father. He had to engage mankind as strictly God. This is sometimes where we find the, the disconnect between the Old Testament and the New Testament. See, we read the Bible and we look at God in the Old Testament, and he seems quite different in the Old Testament than he does in the new. We see God doing things and we're scratching our head going, well, if God is love, why in the world is he saying do that? So a lot of times we just don't even bother reading the Old Testament. Most of us will ignore the Old Testament, just go right to the New Testament. But what we fail to understand is the, the disconnect in this is our our failure to, to realize that in the garden, God no longer served as father of humanity. He became God of humanity. And as God of humanity, who was righteous and holy, but had to deal with an unrighteous and an unholy creation, there was, there was no place really for God to, to demonstrate the love of a father, but only the judgment of a God. This is what, again, we don't, we don't realize. So, so we, look at, we look at this and we go, this just doesn't make sense. How, how, how can this be? This is, this is contradicting itself. Some, of these, some people even use this argument in their debates trying to, to, uh, to, to uh, empower their position that God doesn't exist or that the Bible is not even true. But yet, it wasn't that God didn't want to be Father. Because his whole, his whole heart from the beginning was to be Father. 
This is why there in the Garden of Eden at the fall of man, uh, when, when God began to address sin, when he said to the serpent, I will put enmity between her seed and your seed. And he goes to say, and he shall crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. God was already speaking that there was a plan. Father had a plan to restore humanity to the place where once again we would, be, we would become sons and daughters. But this plan rested on one person. Again, why Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by him. Jesus becomes the door to the Father's heart. We've got to understand that Jesus is the door. To the Father's heart. Look at John 10, 7 and 9. It says this. So Jesus said to them uh, again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is even here identifying himself as the door to the Father. Well, how does this work? What does this mean? How does it play out for us so that we have understanding to really what God has accomplished here? Because listen to me, church, and those who are watching us and, and listening to us or will be even at a later time, uh, it is so important that we, we gain the true understanding and revelation to what God is saying and has accomplished here. Because otherwise, see, we, we still have, most of humanity is still engaged in one way or another to an identification with a God. But not until we come to Jesus Christ does God regain the rightful place and status with us and becomes Father. Why there are so many other religions out there that are trying to put a face and a name and an understanding to God. But there's only one who brings God to the place of returning us to him as a father. His name is Jesus. And the whole ministry, mission, and message of Jesus was this. Jesus, and this is our first point this morning, Jesus revealed the Father. See, most people knew God. The, the teachers of the law knew God. They, they spent their life uh, memorizing the first five books of the Old Testament. They were very aware and familiar. They understood. They could talk. They could teach. They could debate God. But Jesus did not come to reveal God. He came to reveal the Father. This was, the, this was the debate that often existed between Jesus and the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the, in the Gospels because they were, they were like, we are here of our, of, our, of our God, the God of our father Abraham. And Jesus is like, well, I've been sent by my father. Jesus was all about bringing understanding and revelation of the Father. John 17, verses 23 and 20 through 26 says this, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in, in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. 
O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you love me may be in them, and in, uh, may be in them, and I in them. And then in Matthew 11, verse 27, Jesus again saying, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Jesus was given his whole life was given so that you and I would no longer have to simply see God or identify God as God, but we would, we would understand him. We would come to know him. We would have relationship with him as father. Again, the world did not need, the religion of the world taught God, revealed God. The prophets revealed God. Jesus came to reveal the Father. And then number two. Not only did Jesus reveal the Father, but Jesus represented the Father. Jesus revealed the Father, and he represented the Father. In John 5, 19, Jesus again saying, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. And again, in John 12, verse 49, again, Jesus said, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Jesus is saying here, look, the things that I'm doing, I'm not doing just on my own. I'm doing as I've seen the Father do. I'm speaking what I've heard the Father speak. The things I say are the things he's commanded me to say. Jesus is saying, I'm here representing him in everything I do and everything I say. Again, we need to regain understanding and rediscover that the ministry, the mission and message of Jesus Christ was the Father. Third point I want to leave with you this morning is that not only did Jesus reveal the Father, and represent the Father. But this is the good news. See, this is where the gospel, see, the gospel means good news. This is where the good news lies. This is where it's at. Jesus restores us to the Father. Jesus restores us to the Father. In John 5, verses 23 and then 25 through 26, it says, so that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is, is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. And I assure you that the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted that same life-giving power to his Son. 
Then John, John 14, verses 6 through 10. Part of this scripture is where I've drawn the very foundation scripture of this series. Jesus told, told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know that my Father, who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why, do you, why, why are you asking me, show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. Then again in John 17, verse 21. Jesus, which is known as really the last priestly prayer, as praying to the Father, says, I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, our last scripture that I want to read this morning, verses 18 and 19, Paul wrote here, having great insight, revelation to this truth, that I'm speaking on this morning. He wrote, And all of this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. This morning, what I want you to realize is that Jesus, who was the only begotten Son of God, left glory, left the place of his holy habitation, became flesh in the form of humanity. Why was this necessary? Why was it necessary for Jesus to come in the form of man and flesh? Because sin was bound to flesh. So the only way that sin could be rightfully broken and its effects over all humanity, all humanity could be broken was for it to be broken in flesh. So God, in flesh, his only begotten son, Jesus, born in the earth to a virgin named Mary, grew to become a man. A man whose life was not a life given to the religion of his day, a religion that was clearly a religion of law, and not that the law was wicked or unholy or unjust because it was righteous. The law was really what identified, and I've shared this before, and, and, and I shared this, in fact, uh, last Sunday, and if you weren't here last Sunday and, or did not hear that, this message, please, 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 Take time, either get the CD, go online, download it, or watch it. But the law really was the, def the definition of righteousness. It, was, it defined God's righteousness in who he is as holy 
and it had identified our weakness in unrighteousness and where the separation existed between God and humanity and why it was necessary for humanity to have a Savior. Because the law, though it was righteous and holy and able to identify righteousness and holiness, was weak in that it could not restore relationship with God. The law could not restore God as our Father. It could only keep Him as our judge. And the only thing God could do as righteous and holy God to an unrighteous and unholy man was judge man by the righteous law that identified who he was and who we had fallen from. So when Jesus came into the picture, when Jesus presented himself, he did not present himself as the judge. He presented himself as the son. And he was no longer presenting God as the judge who would condemn humanity by law. But he was revealing God as father who would draw them back to himself through Christ. So Jesus gave himself to revealing the father. He gave himself to not just revealing him, but representing him in everything he did. Because really, listen to me, people. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. The only, the only representation of God that was in the earth prior to this point in time was the, the heavy hand and the burden of a law. It was the only thing people understood of God. But then Jesus comes and he begins to, instead of the leper being an outcast from its society and being put out because he was unclean, Jesus would go to the leper and heal them. He would go to the prostitute that the law said should be stoned and say to her, go and sin no more. Jesus became the representation of God as God really wanted to be a father who loved, who had mercy, who had compassion. But this reality of mercy, this reality of compassion, this reality of grace, this reality of love could not have ever been a reality except by way of Jesus Christ. So, Jesus being the revelation of the Father, being the representation of the Father, and being the restore of the Father to us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man can come to the Father but by me. This was before his crucifixion. How would man be restored to the Father? How would mankind be brought to a place where no longer would their, their understanding of God be that of a judge, that of one who must only be feared and never understood? Because the Father, who is love, love was not simply an abstract word that would be tossed around 
to try and delude the heavy handedness of what people understood as God. Love would have to be demonstrated, it would have to be proven. Love pursued you and me out of the heart of a father. And the way it pursued us is that it came into creation, becoming in the likeness of you and me, and then taking on the price and the penalty that you and I had earned so that we no longer would have to bear that. But love took it on itself. As it took the cross and all that the cross brought with it. Jesus hung on that cross. Right before he gave up his last, he shouted, It is finished. What was finished? That everything that would divide humanity from its Father was now covered by the blood of the only begotten Son. So that no longer would you and I stand as strangers before God, simply knowing Him and identifying Him as God, but that we would call on Him as Father because of what Jesus and Jesus alone has done. This is why Jesus is the only way. Let's stand together. Let me just ask if you would to bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning. I want to ask the question of every single person gathered in this auditorium. Not just those gathered here, but maybe those who are even viewing and watching us from another location. This morning I've spoken, and I hope and I, by the mercy and grace of God and the power of His Spirit, have presented with some clarity and understanding and revelation as to why Jesus is the only way. Why this hope, why this salvation, why this life and identification with the Father could never happen outside of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're standing here or maybe you're watching or listening this morning and your only identification with God is God feel like he's only there punishing you for every wrong thing you've done. But the heavy handedness of God is what you know. But I'm here to announce this morning to you that he wants you to know him as father. But the only way that you may know him as father is through Jesus Christ. There's no there there, there is no book of prayers there's no there's no reading regimen of scripture there's no there's no benevolent ministry or list of things you can do for God to become father there's only one way that God becomes father is through Jesus Christ that's it Jesus is it you're here and you've never personally come to a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. You've never really called on the name of Jesus. But you would say, Pastor, okay, I get it. I get it. It makes sense to me now. I've been praying to God, but I understand that, that He wants me to know Him as Father that the blessings that God has for me is not God just simply uh, 
rewarding me for things I've done, but he is wanting to reveal himself as father and every good and perfect thing that comes from from him is is coming from my father but and I know that this is now only this can only happen through Jesus Christ I want to know I want to know I want to know God as father I'm tired of feeling like that I'm having to work my way out of what seems to be just the punishment of a God I want the reality of life and love that comes by way of a father. Jesus is it. This morning, if you're gathered here, you're listening or watching, you don't know the father because you don't know the son, I want you right where you're standing to to raise your hand, lift your hand in this place. That's you. Lift your hand. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Those that lifted their hand, your hands, just keep those hands lifted. I want you to lift them up to the Father. Just lift them up to the Father. I want us to pray, family, out loud together. Those that may be responding this morning, even from your home, I want you to pray this with us. I want us to pray this out loud, but I want you to understand that who you're calling on is Jesus this morning, and Jesus has come to to reveal the Father, to restore you to Him, represent Him in your life. So family, let's all pray this together. Jesus, I realized this morning that you came to restore me to my Father and to restore my Father to me. So Jesus, I accept you because you are the only way. And I, Jesus, ask you to forgive me. My sins have been great. But I now know your love and your grace is greater. Jesus, I want to know my Father through you. Lord, I just thank you for every person that just prayed that prayer across this auditorium and even, Lord, those that have joined us in various places all over the nation and the world online. Lord, I thank you right now by your spirit that you would just move on every single one who's just now responded by faith to your word. And Lord, who have confessed with their, with their mouth the faith of their heart, believing upon you calling upon your name, Jesus. And by your spirit now, they are made sons and daughters of the living God. The spirit, your spirit, which in them cries out to the Father, Abba, Abba, Father. I thank you, Lord, right now. Lord, that the weight, the heaviness, the burden, of sin, is guilt, is condemnation, is removed as far as the east is from the west. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. We celebrate a life that has now been made new in you. If you agree with me this morning, lift your voice and give Jesus praise in this place. As we end this morning, before we dismiss, we're going to do communion together. I want uh, you guys to go ahead, if you would, quickly and pass out the elements. I don't know that there's a better way to end this series and this particular message than with communion. 
And if you, um, if you're online with us, if you have any kind of red juice or wine, red wine at your house, you may participate. Get some bread. You can participate with us from your home. I want us to uh, take communion together again as the elements are being passed. I trust that even in light of this morning's message that the communion will have now a greater significance to you because of what Christ has done and what was truly accomplished in and through his life, restoring us to a father. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hey, PJ, before you give communion, I just kind of want to, you brought up the story of the leper. And I kind of just want to, I don't know, God put that on my heart to kind of explain it a little more. Um, you know, when, when Jesus, he was uh, performing miracles and, you know, he had a, a huge crowd with him. And, uh, you know, the lepers, wherever they were to go, they were to uh, shout out and have a sign that says, I'm unclean, you know, because they weren't to be touched. I don't know if you know what leprosy is, but it's like boils of the skin and, you know, disformities and uh, you know wherever they would go just so everyone knew not that they couldn't visually see it they would have to shout I'm unclean and you know Jesus still he walked up to him and, and you know, everyone must be thinking you know what is this leper doing oh my gosh you know every what is he even doing here and you know Jesus walked straight up to him and he said uh, God if if you're will, if you're willing heal me and uh, Jesus said I, I am willing and he put his hands on him and he said uh, you are clean. And uh, I don't know, I think a lot of us, you know, take that and they're like, okay, he, he healed him of his leprosy, but a lot of us don't realize that we have we have leprosy of the soul, of, of our heart. You know, we're, we're sick in the heart and uh, we need to be healed. And God's ready to do that. You know, he's ready to clean you of everything that you've ever done, of whatever may be going on in your life, of all the sins that you've committed or everything. He's ready to clean you. You know, you just have to walk up to him and say, God, if you're willing, Hallelujah. You know, again, sometimes we take for granted moments like this. They become really a moment that gets swallowed up in the routine of tradition. But when Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember me. The disciples had walked with Jesus now for three years, and they had heard everything he taught. They had seen everything he had done. And they were about to witness the final and the greatest demonstration of love. They didn't realize it at the time that they were taking this with the, with the Lord, what they were about to behold and witness as things would quickly unfold shortly after this final supper but I said at the early in the message that Jesus had to come in flesh because sin bound us sin's, sin's stronghold in us was in the flesh so that so the only way that it's it's stronghold over us could be broken once and for all was for it to be dealt with in the flesh. And you and I couldn't do it. Only Jesus could. So we stand here this morning doing as our Lord instructed us in remembering the body that He so willingly gave. The body that He he laid down so that you and I could be lifted up to the Father. So as we partake of this together this, this morning, we're remembering the sacrifice, the sacrifice of a son as the only begotten, the sacrifice of love.
Jesus, we thank you for the body that was beaten, pierced, bruised for our iniquity, for our sin, for our shame, taking upon itself the penalty of our sin so that we were no longer stand in the, in the place and position of judgment because of it, but we would be set free to stand in the position of your mercy and your grace and your love forever. Jesus, we thank you for this. Let's see. The scripture says, likewise, the disciple, uh, Jesus took the, the cup and Again, the disciple is not really all that, all that aware of what was about to happen. They knew something was about to go down. They just didn't know really what. But Jesus said something to them that was a little, it caused them to kind of tilt their head and wonder a bit. What does he really mean by this? But he took the cup and he says, this is the cup of my blood, the cup of a new covenant, an everlasting one. As often as you drink this, remember me. For the disciples being Jewish, Hebrew children, raised under the, the law, knew that blood was the only way of atonement for sin. The only one that had the right to place that blood on the altar and have God remove the judgment of sin from the people was the priest. They knew that though that the judgment of sin could only be removed by the blood of a sacrificed animal. A ram and a lamb. The sacrificed blood of the lamb would be placed on the mercy seat of God once a year by the priest. First for his sin and then that of the nation. Of Israel. So they understood that part, but what they didn't get at this point was Jesus is now talking about an everlasting covenant, a new covenant that would come by way of his blood. But when the day came that he was hanging on the cross and they watched as their Lord, as Jesus was nailed, was beaten, and as he was pierced in his side, they watched as his blood flowed and they knew this is the blood of the new covenant, the Lamb of God that washes away our sins once and for all. And Jesus said, as often as you drink this, remember me because it's my blood that now covers you. The Father does no, will no longer see you as unjust, as unclean, but because of my blood, he will now see you as sons and daughters. So Jesus, we thank you for the blood of, that you shed. The blood that was sacrificed for us. For our freedom and for our liberty. Jesus, this morning as we partake of this cup, we do so remembering you and celebrating the life that we now have in you. We thank you, Jesus, for your blood that removes our sin and makes us whole and pure again. So we drink this and we celebrate you, Jesus. Let's drink. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. How many of you love Jesus in this place? Let me just hear you give him praise. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask Alex to uh, close us out in prayer. I'm going to be standing in the back. I love you all. I speak and declare the blessing of God over you this week. Please don't forget the baptism at 4 o'clock this afternoon at Marla Park.
Uh, we hope to see each and every one of you there. Bless you, and we'll see you next week. Alex? Um, good word, good word. Uh, I want to speak on uh, to something we were talking about in youth uh, this week. Uh, I don't know how many of you read your word you know, on a daily basis, but you know, as, as I say, we should be reading our word devotionally, and I know I don't read mine as much as I should, but um, you know, the whole point of the Bible is to apply it to our life. So, you know, that knowledge without application literally is pointless. So, I mean, if you're reading your Bible, read with an open heart like like you have no idea what you're doing in life. And you're going to the Word to figure it out. You're going to find out God's heart. We should we should uh, need the Word like the, mur- the nourishment a baby needs from, from his mother's milk. So I pray, uh, I want to pray, God, that we uh, we take today, we take the word, we, we apply it in our lives. We don't we don't leave here. We don't go back to normal Monday to Saturday. But, uh, you know, we, we take it and we, we live by it. And we try to put you in our lives. We try to walk as Jesus. We try to walk as you. We try to be that light in our work. We try to be that light in our school. You know, we want, we want people to people to see God in us. We want our lives to to show Jesus. That's where it all starts. We don't just keep it with us either. We we talk to people about God. We bring people to God. Because that's when things start to change in your life. When you start when you start talking to people, when you start trying to make disciples, when you take what we're talking about here at church or you take the word that you learn in the Bible and you go out and you apply it in your life, watch God do amazing things. So Lord, just watch over us as we go this week until we meet again. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus.